Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and I'm joined today by Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. This is an episode we recorded a few months ago to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early exclusive access, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about today? Today, we're going to be talking about questions like who can give blessings, centering prayer, uh, why did Sarah's husbands keep dying in the book of Tobit, whether the full moon has an effect on us, Ed and Lorraine Warren, what happened in Sunspot, New Mexico, Josephite marriages, the Mandela effect, the Siri hypothesis, the third secret of Fatima, global warming, the Hestel and lights, the wedding at Canada, the origin of the rosary, the mysterious figure of Melchizedek, and many more, or at least more. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great, great lineup of questions. So, folks, please enjoy the show. So, Jimmy, let's not delay. Let's jump right into the very first question. This one comes from patron Jonathan Fairchild, who writes, I was recently in a book study about a book by a famous exorcist. Who, he seemed to have a view that demons affect us more often than we realize. He also set down some guidelines about who can bless whom. Basically, fathers can bless their whole family as head of the household. Wives can bless the children, but not the father. Children can bless each other, but not the parents. And this is because demons are very legalistic and they only respect people with proper authority over them. This seems to contradict the fact that Christ gave us the power to drive out demons. As Catholics, we believe that exorcists should be the only ones to do actual exorcism. However, all Christians have the power to pray for one another, and I thought, bless one another. What are Jimmy's thoughts on this mystery of demons and our power over them in the family unit? This exorcist seems to put a lot of stock in what demons say during exorcism. Should we trust what they say? No, demons are total liars. Um, so do not trust what they say, whether in an exorcism or in other circumstances. And um, in terms of who, who can bless whom, well, uh, the church doesn't have teachings on that. The church recognizes that lay people can perform blessings in a variety of different settings. In fact, if you look in the church's book of blessings, um, there are many different uh, blessings that lay people are authorized to do. And it doesn't require one to be a uh, the head of a household or, or a parent or anything like that. Um, so this gentleman's opinion, I would classify as theological opinion. And it's certainly not church teaching. It would just be theological opinion. And I don't see a particularly good basis for it. I, uh, I recognize that there is a, a kind of hierarchy to the family, but when it comes to blessing, um, people have been saying, God bless you to each other forever. And so the church's practice has recognized that it is possible for ordinary Christians to bless each other or even bless non-Christians by just saying, God bless you, which is um, invoking invoking God and asking him to help somebody. Anybody can do that. It's essentially a form of prayer. All right. Our next question comes from Terry Foley Nelson, who asks, is centering prayer a gift from God or an opening of self to the occult? In my own practice, I felt my love for the Blessed Trinity and others to have increased. Others have challenged me and made me question the Christian roots of this practice. Well, um, so unless you're including something occult in centering prayer, then it's not going to be opening yourself to the occult. Um, centering prayer, for people who may not be aware, is a form of prayer that was um, popularized by some Trappist monks, including Father Thomas Keating and Father Basil Pennington. Um, there's, like a lot of forms of prayer, there is not a single way to do it. However, uh, Father Basil Pennington suggests the following steps for centering prayer. So here's what, here, here's what one of the key advocates suggests. One, sit comfortably with your eyes closed, relax, and quiet yourself. Be in love and faith with God. Two, 
choose a sacred word that best supports your sincere intention to be in the Lord's presence and open to his divine action within you. So you got a word and you're you're sitting there quietly relaxing and being open to God. Three, let that word be gently present as you as your symbol of your sincere intention to be in the Lord's presence and open to his divine action within you. That's actually just a restatement of two. And then the last one, uh, whenever you become aware of anything, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, images, associations, simply return to your sacred word as your anchor. So it's a way of recentering, recentering yourself. Now, this is not a high cognitive form of meditation, but it's essentially being open to the divine presence. And there's nothing occult here. Um, the, the criticisms I've seen of centering prayer tend to um, focus on the fact that it's not highly cognitive, but we don't always have to be highly cognitive in our um, prayer and meditation. Uh, in Romans 8, for example, St. Paul notes that sometimes we don't know what to pray. And he says, in those circumstances, the Holy Spirit uh, assists us with unutterable groans. And so sometimes uh, what sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes uh, we're just overwhelmed by a, a feeling um, that we don't even know how to articulate fully. And it's OK to just have snuggle time with Jesus. You know, you don't always have to be Mr. Spock thinking about something super hard. So I don't see a problem in principle with uh, with this form of prayer. Now, if you make exaggerated claims for it, like this is the greatest thing ever. Well, OK, that's not really going to be well supported. Um, but uh, but I, I also don't see anything um, particularly harmful here either. It seems to me that having quiet time with God is something that is legitimate. In fact, you will find very respected spiritual authors talking about the virtue of just being quiet and being in God's presence. So uh, we'll have some links for people to do further reading. One of them will be a link to a general article on Centering Prayer, and we'll also have a link to the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faiths instruction on some aspects of Christian meditation to give you a sense of where the guardrails are on this subject. Lee Harrison asks, what exactly is happening in the Book of Tobit when Sarah's husbands keep dying? Is it a demon really killing them? If so, how? Possessing Sarah and causing her to kill them? Possessing the husbands and having them kill themselves? Some other way? On another note, I'd be interested in an episode on the decline of Incan or Mayan civilizations, or some of the sites ancient alien theorists use to support their theories. Thanks for all you do. Well, um, so we've got ancient aliens on the list, and eventually we'll get around to doing a show on them. In terms of what's happening in the book of Tobit, we're not told. We are told that each of Sarah's husbands prior to Tobias is killed uh, before they're able to come together. Um, and it is, a, it is not that she is killing them. In fact, that accusation is made by, um, by, against her in the book by her maidservant. If you look at Tobit 3.8, she's directly accused of killing them. But it's clear that this is not what's going on, that she is innocent. She is She's not being possessed by a demon. She's not killing them. Um, there is a, a possible, and it, this one varies by the translation, so different translations take this different ways. But in uh, Tobit 3.14, she emphasizes her innocence. Um, it's not clear, it, this is what the different translations vary on, um, whether she's saying, I'm innocent of sexual contact with a man or I'm innocent of any sin with regard to a man. But it's clear that she is regarded in the book as an innocent. And so we're not really told how the husbands are dying. Um, it could be something like a heart attack. But um, it, really, the book of Tobit is not a historical account. It's an extended parable. And so we shouldn't try to press the details of the parable too much. Kristen Hodgkinson writes, I want to know about full moon phenomenon. I never put any stock into the tales of full moons making people act crazier than normal until I started teaching third grade. 
<laughs> I, just, I have a third grader age yeah, kids. I remember the first day my students were acting out more than they ever had before. I commented about how confused I was about this strange behavior shift to my mentor teacher, and she told me it was because of the full moon. I thought she was nuts until the next full moon when my students' behaviors were off again. The pattern continued the entire two years I taught that grade level. I teach 7th and 8th grade math now. My friend, who was an ER nurse for many years, says the same thing about full moons. They always brace for extra patients and out-of-the-ordinary injuries. What is affecting human behavior this way during full moons? Besides it being aliens, because it's always it's aliens. Always aliens. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the lunar effect is what what this is called, and it has been talked about for ages and ages, and the scientific evidence on it is mixed. There have been studies that have been done that have suggested that the lunar effect is is not real, um, that this is, is, in effect, an urban legend. However, there have also been studies that have suggested that in some cases it is real. In terms of what the effect might be, well, um, I can imagine purely natural causes for what might happen with um, with events that occur at night, because when the moon is full, there is more light. And so people may go out and be more active at night, and that could lead them to, um, to have more accidents for purely naturalistic reasons. Whether there's something else going on that affects human psychology, we, we don't really have a mechanism for what that would be. Um, but there there are at least some studies that have suggested there could be something going on. And so we'll have links uh, to information about the lunar effect and the studies that have been done on it. So you can take a look and read for yourself. Awesome. Uh, Andy Fischerter asks, hello, Jimmy and Dom. I've been wondering about Ed and Lorraine Warren. I thought they'd been debunked years ago, but now they're all over, especially with the Conjuring Universe movies. Is this just a way that the movie producers and directors to put a based on a true story on their movies or were the Warrens somehow sanctioned by the church? A layman doing an exorcism seems more than a little fishy to me. By the way, awesome job on the podcast. Keep up the great work. I especially like the fact that you do the faith and reason perspectives. Thank you, Andy. So um, I have looked a little bit into Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now, they both passed on at this point. Um, they were uh, they were members of the Catholic Church. They um, they as far as I am aware, had no official sanction from the church. And in fact, uh, Lorraine Warren claimed to be a, uh, a light trans medium, which is contrary to the teachings of the church. So uh, that's one more reason I would be, I would suspect, you know, that they, they never had any official endorsement from the church. Ed Warren billed himself as a demonologist. And that meant he read a lot of books about demons and, talked and thought about demons, but he was not himself an exorcist. I don't know if, if he's depicted in a movie as doing an exorcism that that may not be based on anything real, or it might be. Uh, there are not full exorcisms, but deliverance prayers that laymen are capable of doing. Um, and it's always possible a layman could just take the text of the rite of exorcism or make up his own and use it anyway. But in that event, it would be contrary to church law. Uh, I also don't have, um, uh, I'll, at least based on the research I've done thus far, I don't have a lot of confidence in Ed and Lorraine Warren's work. Uh, they were, for example, taken in by the Amityville Horror House. And as we'll discuss in a future episode, that was a hoax. All right. Uh, next feedback comes from, or a patron question comes from Sean Brennan, who asks, what are your thoughts about Sunspot, New Mexico. This was an incident a few years ago when an entire town was cut off to include the post office for a few days. I thought it was strange, and then it didn't get much coverage afterwards. So Sunspot, New Mexico is an unincorporated community in New Mexico, and it's the site of a telescope, which is why it has that name. Uh, it was closed or places within it were closed and evacuated back in 2018, so four years ago. And at the time, it was announced that this was a security measure. This closing was a security measure, but it wasn't clear what was the issue. 
And so um, that led to uh, various theories about what it might be, you know, aliens, government stuff, all kinds of different things. Turned out that the reason for the closure was there was a disgruntled janitor at the telescope who had apparently been making some kind of threats or something like that. And the local authorities reacted by closing everything down. There was also a reporter who was involved in hoaxing uh, some inf- some uh, stories in connection with this. So there is a mixture of genuine details and hoaxed stuff that a reporter came up with because reporters frequently cannot be trusted. Um, in any event, we'll have links to a couple of articles on Sunspot New Mexico, including an initial article from 2018 on the closure, so you can get further details. Disgruntled janitor is like a... TV trope. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, so okay, kind of funny. Uh, Rob Leonardi uh, asks this question. What exactly is a Josephite marriage? And wouldn't the intention to have such a marriage be a cause for an invalid marriage? So a Josephite marriage is one in which a person intends to imitate St. Joseph and, and, and the Virgin Mary by not having marital relations. So even though you get married, you're not planning on ever having sex. Um, and would that result in an invalid marriage? The answer is no because it is, it, it is not necessary for the parties to have sex in order to be validly married. Um, it's very common for them to consummate the marriage afterwards, but it's not actually required. You're married from the moment that you say the vows, and you don't have to be planning on exercising the marital right. You have to be willing to exercise the marital right. Um, So because you are genuinely giving, if you're validly marrying, you're genuinely giving the other person a right to marital relations with you. But as long as you're willing and both party to do that, if the other party demands it, the marriage is going to be valid, even if both of you don't plan on exercising that right. So um, it's, it's a kind of, um, It's a kind of fringe situation in that it, you know, it it doesn't happen very often because most people who are getting married are planning on living a normal conjugal life. Um, But it is something that is possible and can be valid, which is why St. Joseph and the Virgin Mary's marriage was valid. Brooke Kennel asks. Oh, we'll we'll also have a link to Josephite marriages so you can read more. Uh, Brooke asks, my non-Catholic sister posed a really interesting hypothetical. Would two people in the witness protection program who know each other's real identities be able to get married in a canonically valid manner, even though they couldn't share with the priest or the church the names on their sacramental records? So um, there is more than one way of handling this canonically. In the first place, there are the Code of Canon Law does contain provisions, and we'll have a link to this, but it does contain provisions for marriages that are celebrated secretly, where for a sufficient reason, the local bishop can uh, permit a marriage to be celebrated secretly. And that includes the ability to do secret checks on the things that normally have to be checked before a marriage is celebrated. So it would be possible for the people in the witness protection program to have the church secretly investigate and make sure, yeah, this person's baptized and they're not uh, currently married to anybody else. And and so they can marry each other. Um, The church could conduct those investigations secretly and then celebrate the marriage secretly so that it wouldn't come to, it it wouldn't make the press and, and wouldn't appear in the newspaper and things like that as a way of keeping the people in the witness protection program safe. Having said that, if for some reason that was not possible in a particular case or due to the way the program works, um, you know, uh, different witness protection programs are going to work differently. um, There is a natural right to marriage and that right to marriage can supersede the uh, obligation to observe uh, canonical form for a marriage. That's guaranteed. The provisions for that are established in Canon 1116, which we'll also have a link to. And according to Canon uh, 1116, 
Section 1, if a person competent to assist according to the norm of law cannot be present or approached without grave inconvenience, so that would be like the, the pastor of your parish who you would normally approach to marry you, those who intend to enter into a true marriage can contract it validly and licitly before witnesses only, one, in danger of death and two, outside of the danger of death, provided it is prudently foreseen that the situation will continue for a month. So if you've tried to work with the Witness Protection Program in the church um, and you you can't arrange for the marriage to be celebrated uh, by the pastor of your parish or someone he assigns, um, then you could just go ahead and get married anyway because you've already exhausted your your regular options and um, and uh, and you have you can reasonably foresee that it's not the situation is not going to change in a month. And so um, it, it would be possible for these people to get married anyway. So sort of a desert island uh, provision where two people on a desert island with no priest um, want to get married, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, that would be one situation. Um, but really, it's any time. And, and there are some interesting potential implications of this that I am not aware of people really seriously thinking through, but um, but there are more situations in which you can't get married for a month that this could potentially apply to, and being in witness protection is one of them. Wow, interesting. That should would bear a lot more thinking. Uh, our next patron question comes from AJ Beals, who writes, Hi, Dom. Hey, Jimmy. Thanks for your incredible work. Two brief topics that I'm desperately interested in. One, Josephian apparitions. This has been declared the heart of St. Joseph, and I've heard that there are far more, or I think this year has been declared the heart of St. Joseph, and I've heard that there are far more apparitions than commonly known to Mother Teresa. Non-Catholics vilify her, and Catholics try to defend her. I'm having trouble parsing the facts of what I've researched online and really, really want to hear a breakdown of her life from a fair perspective. Who was she really? Was she really just a kind-hearted woman? Or was there some truth to the supposed scandal? So I haven't looked into either of these topics in depth, but we will have a link to an article on apparitions of St. Joseph, including a discussion of the heart of St. Joseph. Um, so you can read about that. Uh, that's from the National Catholic Register. So that's a reputable uh, Catholic news source. We'll also have links to a couple of articles from a few years ago by Jeff Miras of CatholicCulture.org on Mother Teresa, where he talks about the difficulty of establishing uh, um, the facts concerning her life, there were a variety of reasons why this was difficult to do, in part because communists had destroyed them in her home country. Also, she didn't she just didn't like talking about herself very much. Um, but uh, those two articles from Jeff Miras will give you some additional links of recommended re or some recommendations, I should say, for additional resources like books and so forth that have been that have been written on the subject that uh, look at her life and try to make an evaluation. All right. Ryan Taylor writes, Jimmy and Dom, have you guys ever heard of the Mandela effect? It comes from people all over the world claiming that Nelson Mandela died in prison. They even remember key details like his wife's eulogy. So that's where the name comes from. But it's this whole thing in our culture where people remember events big and small that never happened. It also has little effects as well. Like most people my age remember reading the Bernstein Bears book series. However, the name has always been Berenstain Bears. It's really interesting phenomenon in our culture that you guys might like to look into. So, um, yes, I am familiar with the Mandela effect, and it's on the big list of topics for future episodes. Um, for as, as Ryan mentions, you know, it involves or some of the examples it involve uh, include alternate life histories for Nelson Mandela, alternate titles for the Berenstain Bears books, also like Shaquille O'Neal being in a movie called Kazam when he wasn't and things like that. Um, a paranormal explanation for it is th the idea that a person is jumping timelines or jumping from one parallel universe to another where the history was slightly different. However, most uh, people 
have concluded that it's actually just a case of false memories and that there can be various factors that will throw off a person's memory of what happened and that that's really what's responsible. But we will have a link so you can learn more. Jacob Watson writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. Have you read much about the Siri hypothesis that Cardinal Siri became the true pope? It seems really interesting. Thanks. So, yeah, I'm familiar with the Siri hypothesis or Siri thesis. Um, the claim is that he was originally elected as pope um, in the 1958 conclave when John Paul XXIII was elected. And then something happened. Uh, there were uh, threats, allegedly, according to this hypothesis, there were threats from someone outside the conclave, um, who that exactly might have been is up for dis is up for debate. Uh, some people claimed it was Mason. Some people claimed it was um, communist. But in one way or another, according to the theory, uh, Cardinal Sippy, uh, Cardinal Siri um, then declined the papacy and John the 23rd was elected. And there are parallel accounts of similar things happening with Cardinal Siri later on. The problem is, um, number one, even if this had happened, Siri declined the papacy. And even if he was pope for five minutes before declining, he declined it. And so this would have at, at most be a historical curiosity of, oh, well, we had this hidden pope for, you know, five minutes and, and then he, he resigned and um, and we got the publicly known pope. Uh, so that could have happened. But if it did, it has no practical implications. Sometimes people who are advocates of the Siri hy hypothesis are also seat of a contest who want to say, oh, and these other popes that got elected, they were invalid. They were anti-popes. Well, no, they wouldn't be. If Siri said, OK, I I'm, I'm, guess I'm going to decline for what I deem to be good reasons, then that would be a valid either depending on the point at the, in the process at which it happened, it would either be a valid declining of his election or it would be a valid resignation. And then that would clear the way for the election of these other popes who would be perfectly valid popes. So it really wouldn't impact anything if it happened. The second problem is the evidence supporting it is not good. And I do have it on the list of future episodes to talk about, but um, to, to be concise, um, the, the reason that this got conjectured, now, number one, it didn't get conjectured that Siri had been elected Pope until like almost until 20 or 30 years afterwards. So we don't have early attestation to this view. This is a theory that got proposed in the 1980s by a gentleman who was not a cardinal. And he looked back and said, huh, back during that, during that conclave, there were a couple of instances on the first day where they started to burn the smoke and it looked white and then it turned black. And yeah, that's true. Um, and that, that did happen. And that's because uh, they had difficulty getting it to burn correctly. And they've since taken uh, steps to color the smoke to make it really obvious from the beginning what the correct color is. Because according to tradition, the College of Cardinals burn their ballots after each balloting or twice a day. And um, if the smoke is white, it means a pope has been elected. If the smoke smoke is black. It means uh, Pope has not yet been elected. And the color that the smoke appears uh, is controlled. And they just had a problem in the control system. Uh, they, they didn't get it burning correctly um, to indicate black smoke early enough. And at first it looked kind of whitish and then it turned black. Um, there was a second instance uh, later on in the same conclave where it was done after after sunset and the smoke was being uh, lit from below with lighting from below. And that affected the color and made it look whiter than it was. Um, so the evidence is insubstantial. And we don't have cardinals, which is really what we need, because cardinals are the people who are in the conclave. We don't have cardinals saying this is what happened. This is after the fact speculation. And Cardinal Siri, 
himself never referred to this theory. He never claimed this was true. Um, and he went on to uh, to serve in offices he was appointed to by uh, future popes like John the 23rd and Paul the sixth. So this is really it, it would really be who cares. You, I mean, it'd be interesting, but it would be who cares from a canonical perspective. It wouldn't really affect anything, even if true. But we just don't have evidence for it being true. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Uh, next question comes from Drew Montroy. Jimmy, have you watched the Secrets of Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch series on the History Channel? I'd love to hear your take on the show, the science experiments they've run, and some of the results they've seen. There's some drama and production hype, to be sure, but there also seems to be a lot of interesting things going on. What do you think? Well, um, uh, Dom, I'm going to ask you to come in on this one because you've seen more of the secrets of Skinwalker Ranch than I have. Um, I've seen part of the first season and uh, parts of individual episodes. And yeah, it does have some hype in it, but um, but no, it's not as bad as some other documentary series I've seen. I've seen much worse. Um, so I'm thankful for that. But uh, what's your impression, Dom? Well, I have watched uh, nearly every episode, I think, so far that's that's come out, and uh, I, I've enjoyed it. It's it's kind of fun. They do fall into some of the reality show tropes of repeating things and sometimes making more of a big deal over something than I think the what they at least show on TV warrants. Uh, however, there are some really if, if they're being truthful and that's that's the caveat we always have to enter, you know, if, if songs are not messing with what they're saying is happening. Uh, there are some things happening that are hard to explain. What I do wish is that there was more obvious weirdness going on. Like there is no, uh, like what we've seen in when we talked in the episode on Skinwalker Ranch, we, we haven't seen the big ca uh, canine thing. They've talked about it and talked to people who said they've seen it. Um, they've shown uh, security footage of something floating through the air, but is it a blue orb like we talked about in the blue orbs episode? Uh, I don't know, you know, so and then there are times when they say, oh, there's this weird thing going on uh, that's affecting stuff flying over the ranch. Uh, and so we can't fly. And then they show a drone shot of that very moment. And I'm like, well, the drones are OK. <laughs> so hmm. sometimes there are some things I have to question. But on the whole, I feel like there's something very strange going on there. And I and while there's a little bit of hype. I'm not sure it's all hype. And so that's I, I'm, I'm, what I'm waiting for is the really clear evidence of something uh, which we haven't seen yet. OK, well, let me know when we do. <laughs> I will. I will. I'll certainly let everyone know. Uh, and then our next question comes from Jim Kramer, who writes, since listening to the series on the third secret of Fatima some months ago, a recurring question lingers, but not one specifically related to the secret being fulfilled. If Sister Lucia were instructed by church authorities to state the third secret was satisfied, although it may not have been, would her vow of obedience as a religious sister compel her to state a mistruth? No. Uh, if you have taken a religious vow of obedience, it does not require you to tell things, to say things that you know are false. So the thing to do in that situation would be to deny uh uh, the request to say something false. And so, no, Sister Lucia would not have been bound by her vow of obedience to lie to the public. Okay. Uh, Doyle asks, Howdy, Jimmy. This may not be that mysterious, but I really do not understand the parable of the unjust steward in Luke 16. What gives? It seems to me as if he managed his master's accounts poorly and then got caught. And when he was given a last chance, it felt like he spent that chance looking out for his own neck and then the master seems to think it's all good in the end. I don't really get it. And I would love to know more. So um, this is one of the things about the parables of Jesus that have to be borne in mind is that they sometimes use a form of reasoning that's uh, the philosophical term for it is a fortiori. And 
basically a fortiori reasoning means, well, if it goes like, well, if this is true, how much more should this other thing be true? And when Jesus uses a fortiori based parables, it can be kind of confusing to people who aren't familiar with this, because another one that's the same way is the parable of the unjust judge, where the widow keeps coming to the judge and demanding justice. And even though the judge is an unrighteous man, he eventually gives her justice. And in this parable, um, what Jesus is doing is, in that parable, I should say, let's deal with that first. Um, In that parable, Jesus is saying, well, if a, even an unjust judge can relent and give someone justice when they keep coming to him and appealing to him. How much more should you be encouraged when praying to God? Because God is not an unjust judge, and he will be even more ready to grant your request, assuming it's something that's good for you. Um, so that's an how much more or a fortiori type argument. In the case of the, um, of the unjust steward, it, we have something essentially similar going on. Jesus is talking about how even worldly people, people who are not righteous, um, will make plans for their future. And he tells this story about an unjust steward who is going to get fired. And then the steward, um, to protect himself for his own future, he makes deals with his master's creditors or his, um, his master's debtors where he decreases their debts to his master. So he's, he's clearly doing something wrong here, uh, but he is being shrewd in providing uh, for his own future because after his uh, current position comes to an end, he'll be able to go to these people who he helped and rely on their uh, generosity. And so he'll, he'll be able to avoid, you know, begging and or ditch digging and so forth. And so he's being shrewd in terms of his own future. And his master appreciates that, even though he knows he's being cheated by the guy, he still kind of he still acknowledges, hey, this guy is being shrewd. And it's that shrewdness, not the specifics of what the guy does that are the lesson part of the parable. Jesus wants us as righteous people to be shrewd too. Uh, he wants us to uh, to plan carefully for our futures and do whatever it takes to secure a good future with God in heaven. And he, he teaches that in a kind of backwards way using this a fortiori parable. But um, but that's essentially what he's saying is is uh, Christian people, r- religious people, they need to be shrewd about the future, too. And so if this guy um could be commended for being shrewd about his future how much more will god commend you for being shrewd about your future all right joel lowell asks does jimmy think it is likely that gambling odds makers for sports use remote viewers to assist in setting the betting lines uh, so we'll have a link to betting lines um, so people who are not familiar with that term can learn about them. Basically, uh, my understanding, and I'm not big into sports ball or sp- sports ball gambling, but uh, my understanding is betting lines effectively is like a point spread. And so you can say, well, I think this team is going to you know, do better by seven points than this other team. So we're going to take that into account in, in betting. Um, on the outcome of a game. And it's certainly possible that gambling odds makers for sports could use remote viewers for that. I don't have any evidence that they're doing so. I do have evidence that um, remote viewers have been attempting to uh, precognize the outcome of games and and have been betting on those games and so there is remote viewing in the uh, in the sports ball betting community but i don't have evidence of the odds makers using the viewers i have um, evidence of the players using remote viewers Given how much money is involved in both sports and investing, I wouldn't be surprised if some of that money has been gone to remote viewing uh, on the off chance that it would provide mm-hmm. a slight advantage. Uh, then our next question comes from Elliot Jenneman, who writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. I was wondering about the Marian apparition of Our Lady of Good Help in Green Bay, Wisconsin. 
I'm a native of Wisconsin and a frequent traveler to Green Bay, and I've only recently heard about the apparition there. I read it's the first approved Marian apparition in the United States. Could you shed some light on it for us? Well, it's been a while since I've looked into Our Lady of Good Help, but when it happened, uh, when it was approved back in the year 2010, I wrote an article about it. And so we'll have a link to that article. It goes into the background and the approval process and so forth. Um, but, uh, but check out the article and uh, it should give you a good basis for understanding it. Uh, Connie Zinkowitz asks, have you checked out the BTK killer in the Wichita, Kansas area? He was caught and is in prison, but it haunted the Wichita Metro for many years. Yes, I am familiar with uh, with the BTK killer. Um, BTK stands for bind, torture, kill, which were three of the things that this guy was interested in. And he um, he had been active as a serial killer. And then he kind of went inactive and was eventually discovered working at a church. And he got his name is Dennis Rader. Um, he was captured and uh, put in uh, put on trial and put in prison where he is today. Um, I we don't do a lot of true crime on Mysterious World, so I even though I I think I've got him on the list, I don't know if we'll actually do him. There are other serial killers um, that I want to do first, but we may indeed do uh, do him in the future. And in the meantime, we'll have a uh, link to where people can read about him. Doreen McCarthy asks, "What do you think about global warming? I mean, climate always changes over time." I know regional areas can be destroyed, but are we really the cause of the change or is it the national natural progression of time? Also, what about the Hestalin lights? Do we know what causes them? So um, I in terms of what I think about global warming, I mean, I'm open to to being persuaded that uh, that you know, mankind is playing a significant role in it, but I'm not convinced of that. Um, it seems to, uh, based on the reading that I've done thus far, um, I, I think that, uh, I think that there is evidence that some of the science has been cooked and, you know, I, just because a, a body at the United Nations says something of a scientific nature, that doesn't mean I believe it because bodies because the united nations is a political organization and political organizations are subject to uh political influences and they're subject to um distortion and and cooked science i mean we've we've seen how the world health organization which is also run by the un has been um you know effectively hamstrung uh in many respects by china to where for the first, uh, it, it only recently has the, uh, as the head of the World Health Organization talked, you know, openly in, uh, about the idea that, hey, the COVID-19 virus may really have been a lab accident, which is something that China just does not want to admit. And so, um, but there is significant evidence that it could be, and it's taken a long time for the for the World Health Organization to countenance that. Well, there are trends and fashions in science in general. And so the United States uh, panel on uh, climate change is is something that I also can't just take at face value. Um, I, I have seen evidence that points one way. I've seen evidence that points another way. There are climate shifts across um the course of time that have had nothing to do with humans. It's possible that uh, this time there is a role. Uh, how big that role is, is also uh, something that's open to question. And I'm continuing to research the area, but I, I think critically, and I don't just automatically assume one side is correct, especially when you have people doing highly politicized science. And it's clear that there is, uh, a lot of politicization here because you hear these doomsday predictions. Uh, you, I mean, you know, we've got 12 months to fix the climate or we've got five years to fix the climate or winters or a thing of the past. And, or, and you hear a lot of nonsense claims like um, there's been a rise in hurricanes uh, and so forth because of global warming. And all of these things are just really problematic, and I'm especially suspicious of the more extreme 
claims, the the climate doom scenarios have repeatedly been falsified. And so you, you go back 20 years and they're making claims and, and well, OK, we're clearly not doomed yet. Um, so so between climate models, not repeatedly not being accurate in, in their predictions and uh, especially the doomsday predictions, this is an area where. I suspect the truth is somewhere in the middle, but I have not yet done the research to pin down exactly what I think the truth is. Now, in terms of the Hestelin lights, so the Hestelin lights are on the list for the future. Hestelin is a valley in um, in Scandinavia, as you can hear. It's got just like when we did the Ice Dalin woman, the Ice Valley woman. Well, Hess Valley is another location, and there are these weird lights there. And people have footage of them and they're flying around up in the air. These are not car lights on a distant road. Um, what exactly they are is a subject of discussion. And so we'll have a link to where uh, people can read about the Hestelin lights. But uh, we will be talking about them in the future. And they one thing, not the only thing, but one thing that they may be is a kind of um, of earth light caused by the piezoelectric effect where crystals underground are put under pressure and it generates a um, it generates an electromagnetic field that can produce lights. And so that's one thing the Hestelin lights may be, but they may be any number of other things as well. And so we'll be talking about them. All right, Rob Leonardi asks, I know there is an exegesis about the wedding at Cana and using it to show Mary leading Jesus to start his ministry and Jesus being the obedient son. But I was thinking about a more modern take on it and had a question. At the wedding at Cana, we see Mary worried about the wine and then Jesus saying it is not his hour. Why was Mary so worried about this? Could it have been she was working at the wedding like a wedding coordinator or volunteering as one but still a family friend? If so, would Jesus have been there to help his mom or to volunteer himself? If Jesus was scheduled to work the wedding, could they not, the not my hour, was Jesus saying that his shift hadn't started yet? So um, I've seen people uh, propose that Mary may have been working some kind of official, in some kind of official capacity at the wedding, like a wedding planner. Frankly, I don't see evidence for that. Um, that's not the language that John uses. Uh, he just says there was this wedding and Jesus and his mother and his disciples were there. And so uh, based on the language John uses, I don't, th I don't think they had any official capacity. I think they knew the people, um, but it would be unlikely that they would have come from another town to have an official role in planning or putting on the wedding. Um, also, there's a very clear distinction in the text between Jesus and the role of the servants. And there's also a major domo at the wedding who would be in charge of things. And none of those people are Jesus. So I don't I don't see any basis for saying that uh, that that Jesus or Mary were here in an official capacity. I think they were there just as guests, which is what John's language would suggest. Now, they they would have known the people over in Cana. Cana is not very far from Nazareth. Um, they would have known these people, uh, at least by reputation, but probably more than that. And so I would think Mary has... Um, has an, has taken an interest because she's a she's a kind-hearted woman and she yeah she's nudging her son to to do something to help these people out um but i don't think she was working officially and i don't think my hour is not yet come jesus is is referring there based on the literary structure of the gospel to what happens at the end of the gospel. This wedding is at the beginning. And so he's foreshadowing the end by talking about that. And so I wouldn't think the, ah, my shift hasn't started yet is not the, uh, is not what Jesus is talking about in my opinion. Uh, just a Hallahan writes, hi, I mentioned it on your discord. Was, uh, the oh, sqpn.com slash discord. If you all, all want to check it out. But I'd be fine with the patron's questions answer. What would be Jimmy's conclusion on the origin on the, of the rosary? 
Was it supernaturally handed to St. Dominic as a one Our Father, ten Hail Mary form? Was it just a pious legend invented by the later Dominican Blessed Alan de la Roche? So my understanding is that the rosary developed over an extended period of time, um, in, spanning from before St. Dominic to after Alan de Roche, and it's continued to evolve in uh, in the modern world. I mean, John Paul II introduced the, uh, the joyous mysteries or the luminous mysteries a few years ago, for example. Um, we'll have an article on the history of the rosary so that you can read about it. Um, I, I am aware of, you know, the claims that, oh, our, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to St. Dominic and gave it to him, and that's its start. But we have evidence of rosaries being used prior to that time, and even if, it, if not in the current form of the rosary, and we don't have good evidence that's contemporary to St. Dominic of such an apparition having occurred with him. So, um, so it does look like that particular story is a pious legend and the real history of the rosary is a longer and more um, involved one. Tim Harden says, uh, hello, Melchizedek is a mysterious figure in Genesis, but obviously important. What is known about him in his kingdom of Salem? Are there any good Catholic treatments of him, whether book length or shorter? Well, so uh, Melchizedek is a is a famous figure in Second Temple period literature, and there's a lot that was written about him. Um, what we know from uh, the text of Genesis is that he was he was not a Jew. He was um, a, a um, he was the king of Salem. And exactly where Salem is, is something that people have had different opinions on. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, Salem was the same as Jerusalem. And so Melchizedek, on this view, would have been a king of Jerusalem at the time of Abraham. So this is long before it became David's capital. Um, and he, we're told in, in Genesis that he's priest of God Most High which would not be unexpected for a royal figure. Oftentimes, the king and the high priest were the same person. That was certainly the case, for example, in Egypt, where Pharaoh was also the high priest of Egypt. Um, it, in, in fact, Israel's situation of having a different high priesthood um, than its political leadership was a little unusual. Um, there, there were lots of places like Rome, for example, where the priests and the rulers were basically the same group of people. Um, there was a lot of speculation about Melchizedek in the Second Temple period literature. Um, oh, I, I was going to mention another proposed location for Salem, though, is Mount Gerizim in, uh, in Samaria. According to uh, Samaritan authors, it was really Mount Gerizim, not Jerusalem, that was, or it was, it was really their holy mount, not Mount Zion in Jerusalem, that, uh, that Melchizedek was king of. However, you know, you've got this dispute about where should the temple be? Should it be on Mount Zion or Mount Jerusalem? And Jews and Samaritans just disagreed on that. Um, we will have a couple of links to uh, short treatments of Melchizedek. Uh, one is from the Catholic Encyclopedia, and one is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. And so they'll give you uh, a little bit more information about the history of thought on Melchizedek. Really, all we know is what's in Genesis. And beyond that, it becomes very speculative. Uh, but, uh, but those two uh, stories should give you a starting point. We hope you've enjoyed this patron's question show. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and have your questions answered on future shows for patrons, go to sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What are your theories about any of the patron questions that Jimmy answered? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 
4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for doing the video and animation work on Mysterious World. You can check out their work by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where um, we have all the Mysterious World episodes in video format. And we've had a lot of great feedback from people about how much they like the video and animation work, how much it adds to the audio presentation of the podcast. So definitely go by and check it out. And while you're there, uh, be sure to uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to grow my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you uh, subscribe and then hit the bell notification so that you'll always get notifications whenever I have a new video. Excellent. So Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next time, we're going to be going back to the Victorian era in London and looking at the mystery of a famous figure known as Spring-Heeled Jack. Hmm, interesting. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com. A-A-R-O-N-V.com making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. My pleasure. Thank you. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Oh.